So I'm joined today by Jaya Ashmore, who is a meditation teacher. And so Jaya, I thought I'd start by turning it over to you. And if you could just tell us a little bit more about yourself, um, maybe walking us through the, the journey that you've had arriving to where you are now, um, being a meditation teacher. Sure, be glad to. So I grew up in the United States. And when I was in college, when I was 20, I also did a contemplative study semester in India, which was my great luck. And that also included meditation. So I fell in love with India, which was much more rural. And um, so I, I fell in love with the countryside of India and pe people who still some of my closest people are there. And I ended up spending a lot of my adult life in India. Um, basically for meditation. When I first went, I had two goals. I wanted to learn to meditate and I wanted to do some service work. I had, I had a sense of wanting to do service work and I had a question in the back of my mind about that, of whether that was some kind of a um, little bit white supremacist or whatever, like the, the kind privileged person going to try to save the world or something like that. And also just, I wanted to know, is that just an idea or is this, if I'm really in a situation where their help is needed, what is that actually like for me rather than just the idea? Uh, I ended up spending decades more in India than anywhere else and more for spiritual practice than anything else. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. And somewhere in there, around in 1998, one of my teachers invited me to start teaching. And I thought, yeah, sure, someday. <laughs> I imagined when I was back in the West, he's a British guy. So I thought I would probably you know, observe how he does his thing a couple of times. I thought there would be some prescribed process that would happen, which is not how he works. <laughs> he just He says he just throws people in and they can sink or swim more or less. Um, and so in 1999, I did some teaching with him and some other new teachers and kind of never looked back from there. So even though um, I'm a shy person and public speaking was really um, horrific, <laughs> um, I just kept rolling with it. So it's been more, it's been 22 years. That's been my main uh, I don't know what to call it, career or way of being in the world. Okay, thank you. And in terms of like, you know, there are many different styles of meditation. Some of them we're learning about in our class. Um, would you say that there's any particular styles of meditation that, that you teach? In, in particular, when we look at your website, which our class has done, you know, we can see this talk of deep rest meditation. So I wondered if you could definitely talk about deep rest, but also if there's any other kind of styles that you draw upon or um, what that looks like. Sure. On the study, Buddha studies program in India, we had um, kind of a section of Vipassana meditation that was mostly mindfulness. And I found it incredibly dry. It was a noting practice. Like you, if you're walking, then you're saying in your mind, lifting as you lift your foot and moving as you move it forward and putting as you put it down. And so I had this question, where is the love? We could, now I might say, where's the juice? <laughs> and then we had a Zen section and then we had a Tibetan Buddhist section where, where we were given very hot, what are considered very, very high teachings of Dzogchen. Usually people would have done many, many years of practice it to be ready to receive those teachings. And here we were just showing up, not having any idea what we were receiving. <laughs> um, and then later on, I was with a group of teachers from mostly from Europe and the US doing a retreat in the same town in India. And I, it was much easier to, I think having the cultural sort of translation helped to receive very similar teachings of insight meditation uh in a way that didn't land in my perfectionism and didn't feel so dry i could feel more a sense of the juice mm -hmm. and that we're allowed not only to be feeling the lifting pushing pudding but 
that that's in a context of appreciation and wonder for the night sky and the sound of the frogs at night, you know, in the bamboo or whatever. <laughs> so, and then um, a few years later, I met one of my main teachers, Punjaji, whose teaching is a bit similar to the Dzogchen teaching. And it's much more of joy and celebration and feeling where in the human spirit, we're already free something unshakable and something innocent. And, and so all of that combined together was a good balance for me. I think with just the Buddhist teachings that the way I received them, it was very dry and I was trying too hard and then having more of the joy and celebration. Um, but then I was asked to teach in the insight meditation tradition. And so I taught the way I had been taught and it, I was bringing in some of the joy and some of that, the context and wonder, but I was trying to do a good job the way I had been given the tradition. Um, but meanwhile, my own practice all along had included lying down and it included a lot of the being in nature with a sense of quiet and also vastness and wonder and wide heartedness. And so I continued to do my own practice, which was lying down for example, practicing yoga and then in Shavasana, I would just stay for a long time. And I didn't think, oh, that's my real meditation practice. Or I would do loving kindness practice. I don't know if you're going to touch on that in the course. I would recommend that you do. <laughs> I think it's one of the more important practices. For me, it was um, maybe life-saving perhaps, uh, might not be too strong a word, uh, to help counter some of the perfectionism and sense of isolation and being hard on myself or feeling that I, I shouldn't go with what's juicy or I shouldn't go with um, where the heart would go. So I would, I started to do my loving kindness practice lying down, but I felt like I was, you know, sneaking something and doing it not quite right properly, not quite properly. Um, so it was kind of this slow over many years realization that for me, what worked best was lying down and a much more letting it happen kind of approach. And when I tried to do meditation, then all of my too much trying came on. The, the too good student that's trying to get the grade or trying to get the approval or trying to get it right just was so dominant. And when I, would, when I could come in my own way, in my own time, off the clock, off the schedule, out of sight, it was very often I just gravitated to lying down or when I would lie down, for example, in my yoga practice, good things would happen. So it, I was teaching for about five years, I think. And I kept meeting people that I was like, I think you should, might want to try lying down. And eventually it was like, I think I better just teach a retreat where I tell people in advance, we're going to try an experiment of meditation through deep rest and more putting it out front instead of in the back <laughs> that this is what I've really found to be helpful for myself and many other people. If you wanna try sitting, go for it. If you wanna try lying down, go for it. But where do you feel more at ease, more likely to encounter you know, something natural in ourselves, more likely to feel at home on the earth, more likely to come a little bit loose and free from the programming that, that we've received and accepted. Yeah, so at first I was teaching retreats that we called Vipassana, which means literally, vi can mean before or behind and pas is to see. So, and na is like technique. So the way of seeing from behind or before. But during the years that I was teaching retreats, the word Vipassana for many people came more and more to, to be equal to a particular approach to Vipassana. Mm -hmm. uh, from the teacher called Goenkaji. And that was very different from deep rest meditation, that if people are really identified with sitting um, as the only way, then there comes a time where they come to a dead end, where there's just a sense of the small me doing my small spiritual path for myself. And it's about kind of mind control. And the more I get the mind control, the better I feel about myself. And it's kind of feeding the spiritual ego. Whereas through lying down for many people, it's easier to fall out of that more controlling 
mode into other layers of mind and consciousness. And so there was a lot of resistance from a lot of people when I called my retreats the Pasna retreat. And so then I changed the name to Deep Rest Retreat. People had more of a sense of, oh, okay, this is this is a different approach. Mm. And then there's there was a slight downside to that sometimes because people might come to a deep rest retreat thinking, I'm going to go to a spa. And the the whole point is that we're kind of leaving behind our polarized sense of work and leisure and coming to find that rest is very alive and enriching and creative and that creativity and action can come really, really well from a less controlled, less controlling kind of place in our psyche. I love hearing that. Um, and it resonates. I, I think we both follow this account on Instagram, the, the NAP ministry. Um, like all this talk about how like, the value of rest and not, not that we should pursue rest for these kind of productivity values, like that would feel a little ironic to, to do that, right? But, but that there actually are like a lot of, um, yeah, a, a lot of really positive outcomes um, first in our inner dispositions, but also in our external actions that come from a place of, of, of deep rest or of, um, yeah. yeah, true relaxation. Um, I think it's coming into something that's, that suits the human being, body, mind, and spirit better. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I want to kind of transition from this idea of different postures of meditation. So you, you spoke that a, a kind of the standard default one is a seated posture on the ground. Sometimes people sit in a chair um, in deep breaths. You invite people to, to lie down. Um, different postures having different, like, well, our body is being held in different ways in all of these postures, right? And, and I want to transition this kind of focus on the body to talk a little bit more about the body and about um, like feeling, feeling in touch with the body or, or, or feeling um, like letting the body be a way that we, re, we, we receive communication. Embodied knowledge is the phrase that I'm using in our class a lot, um, how we can learn things through our bodies, um, not just through our intellect, not just through our kind of cerebral brain, but that we actually have this wisdom that we can access through our bodies. I wonder if you could um, share whether you, you know of any common challenges that people experience when they try to tap into their bodies or, or what that process looks like when people begin. Yeah. I think lack of confidence is often a main obstacle for most people. Mm. I think we, we attend a meditation session that might be guided and someone suggests that we feel our lower belly, for example or I often would suggest to feel the feet to get as far as we can away from the head <laughs> for a little break, a little relief from all that up there, thinking and so on. And it sounds like such a simple thing to do that for most people we're surprised by how short of a time we can really stay with feeling a lower belly or feeling the feet. And then there's a frustration because we, we don't even realize, we assume that this is a really simple, easy thing, almost, almost too simple to, is too kindergarten. Like I'm a, I'm a student in university, like feel my feet, that's too easy. But then when we actually try to do it, it's very humbling how, for most people, how many thoughts come bombarding us. The more we try to be quiet, the more thoughts come is a very common experience. And if people yeah. could know that that's normal mm -hmm. and that almost everyone goes through that mm -hmm. and that just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. Yeah. If we could approach it the way we might approach any art or any skill, if we wanted to learn to play the flute or do calligraphy or learn how to grow tomatoes or ride a motorcycle or whatever, we would not think, oh, that's really simple. It must be really easy. Mm -hmm. I must, I should be able to do it without even doing it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We would, with every skill and art that we would kind of try to get into, we would know that there's going to be a beginning phase, that we're not good at it, that it doesn't happen the way we want it to happen. 
So that's, for me, that's kind of what I notice as a main obstacle. Most mm-hmm. people think, oh, I could never meditate because I think so much. Yeah. Yeah, I hear that a lot too. Um, what do you mean when you say feel like, you, so you invite people to feel the feet for the simple reason that the feet are, are very, very far from the head, this idea that we, you know, we can start there to kind of remove ourselves from the cerebral brain area. What do you actually mean when you invite people to feel the feet? Like, are you talking like placing, placing a hand on it? What, what, what are you meaning? Yeah, it could be, that's where it's really more comfortable to talk directly to a particular person Mm -hmm. to find out what is your experience when I say, how about feeling your foot? How about feeling a foot? What happens when you hear me say that? Mm -hmm. Um, For some people, they would more talk about their foot. And then I might say, okay, let's go, let's try again. Tell me, you know, three textures that you feel in one of your feet. Or do you, maybe it would be even more simple than that. Do you feel that your foot has some weight? Or if actually even more simple, I'd first say, do you feel your foot? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And they might say, I'm not sure. A lot of people in the beginning would be more honestly saying, I actually, I'm not sure Mm -hmm. if I feel my foot. And so then I might say, and that would often be more spontaneous in relating to a particular person. Maybe I would say to someone, do you feel the coolness or the warmth of your foot, depending on the weather? Um, Or do you feel the weight? Do you feel that your foot has any weight? Or do you feel that your foot takes up space? Or can you feel your sock? Or can you feel the grass, depending on the situation? And then getting the feedback from them and including in the tone of voice, like, well, yeah, I think I can feel a little warm. Or something might catch my attention to give a very specific place in the foot. So the foot is more specific than the whole body, but there's a lot that goes on in the foot. So like between the big toe and the next toe sometimes is a good place. Or like you said, putting a hand, actually two hands, whole, if you put your hand on your foot, what do you notice? Mm-hmm. Can you feel from the hand side that there's the foot there? And then after a while, can we come into the foot, even though the hands have so much more landscape in our sensory nervous system. So we're, we're used to feeling our hands and they can take up a lot of space in our attention, but could we shift into the foot and from the foot side, the side where the foot is feeling that there are hands there mm-hmm. and just let it be that that's gonna be more pale. Mm-hmm. We're not gonna be able to feel much compared to the hands in our feet. Um, and what's, what's cool about this, I've done this with my son sometimes when he would be having a meltdown and he would want help to come out of the meltdown. And I would say, can you feel your feet? And he would say, stop saying that. That's not going to help me. I need help. I need real help. And I say, okay, but do you feel your feet? <laughs> That's not going to help me. And, okay, tell me three textures. And eventually he'll say, okay, yes, I can feel the softness of the sock. I can feel the warmth. I can feel the weight. And he's about to say again, it's not helping, but he's already, his breathing has already changed and he's more regulated. And then we can go to, okay, how about a longer out breath? That's not gonna help. But by then he's more, he might be even joking around and he's gonna purposely do a bigger in breath Mm -hmm. just to kind of, but he's already joking around, he's in a better space. So. I was going to ask, and you kind of answered it with that illustration of your son, but I was going to ask and on the level of, on one level, it's a very basic question. On the other level, it's a very complicated question. It's like, why? Like, what's the benefit or what's the draw <clears throat> to try to connect to our bodies? Like, why Why do we do it was going to be my question. And if you want to add anything, go for it. But I feel you've just also illustrated why we do it. It, it can yeah. soothe us. It can bring yeah. us back. But I don't know if there's anything else you want to add of why, why do we connect to our bodies? Yeah. I would say two things in response to that question. It is for most people really helpful to come to the, this direct nonverbal capacity as human beings to simply feel sensations, to realize that it is different from thinking about it. To, fe- to feel warmth is different from the idea of warmth, the memory of warmth, liking or not liking warmth. And that's a capacity that's already in us and it's already immediate. We've already felt that sensation. If, if we would just 
gently move a hand somewhere that feels comfortable for, for you on your body, this, we can feel that the sensations are here and gone, here and gone, but that's happening much faster than I could think it. So this much wider part of my mind that somehow has already felt that, already felt that, already felt that, just directly. And so I think it, it gives a lot of self-confidence to realize there's, there's a capacity already in us that I call already awareness sometimes. It, there's an already awareness that's already heard the sound, that's already felt the sensation before we can name it. I find that really interesting because sometimes um, as an academic who spends a lot of time in my head with, you know, with my thoughts, et cetera, I sometimes zone in on the idea that, oh, I have too many thoughts. I can never, the way I could speak about my thoughts is, is um, much slower than the way I could think my thoughts. And you've kind of added another level there, <laughs> which is like, sure, fine. We can't express things to others as quickly as we might think them. But maybe the other level to bring us back is like, we also can't even think through and articulate things as quickly as we can feel the sensation of them, which yeah. is just interesting to kind of realize like, how quickly things are happening in the body. Um, yeah. And, and if we really think about what's called the unconscious mind, but is it really unconscious? <laughs> if we relax into a wider mind, we're more in touch with what we had called unconscious perceptions coming in, mm -hmm. which is there's just so many more perceptions coming into the so-called unconscious mind mm -hmm. than can fit through the conscious mind. And so we start to get a sense of what the conscious mind its role, how it might be helpful. And yet there's also other kinds and parts of our mind that have their place and are helpful and that can work together really well. Mm -hmm. um, but I just wanted to say the other thing in response to the question of why connect to the body is mm -hmm. it's not, I don't find that there's any one thing that is always good for all people at all times. So it could be for someone that it's not helpful to try to connect to their body for lots of different reasons that could be. Mm -hmm. And one of them could be that it's just easier for them to connect in some other way, like through sounds or through image, through seeing, mm -hmm. or through remembering a moment of feeling gratefulness. Mm -hmm. And if that works well for them, it, there's juice in that and they can just more naturally um, and enjoyably get kind of drawn into connection with life, into the experience of already participating in, a, in the web of life, mm. then that's good. So they don't need to bypass from their own path just because everybody else is saying, feel your body, feel your body. Eventually, it, you know, slowly, slowly practicing, it can be good to, to be more embodied for sure. But it doesn't need to be everybody's way and um, it's not everybody's entry. Mm. But the direct, direct perceptions, so taste, smell, sight, sound, or touch can be a really good way to go because of what I said before, we're in touch with this fine and wide capacity for this incredible vividness of experience. That's also, you know, that sound that it's so itself and it's so here and gone. Mm -hmm. And so we have the mystery of life right there from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's cool. That's powerful. It leaves room for everybody's curiosity, curiosity to move in its own way. Um, but sometimes it's not through a sense of perception, it's more through the mind. So loving kindness meditation, um, some kind of imagination or visualization, or through a memory of a, of a feeling of well-being. And then I might ask, the first, I might ask the first question, how does that feel in your body when you remember being grateful? It's another kind of sensation that can be so helpful to go with. I like that you add that, that, um, you know, as helpful as it can be to kind of tune into the body that it might, there's almost like a maybe not now kind of openness to it is 
um, yeah, for, for all people, there might be many reasons why now is, it's not really working to, to feel the foot, et cetera, but that there are other ways. Um, and we, we've taken a look at certain parts of your website. We looked at the, um, the relaxed seeing meditation um, exercise. So where you can kind of focus on, on different objects around. And I, I guess like these are, you know, like you, you offer and you do teach and practice like many different ways of how people can tune into that, um, that slippery now is how I think you often speak about yeah. it, right? The slippery now, the thing that is passing us by yet is right in front of us, but passing us by. Um, I wondered if we could speak a little bit about some other bodily postures. I'm thinking in particular Jinshin, um, because I first learned of Jinshin through knowing you, I'd never heard of it before. And it's one of those other things that is very, very simple, <laughs> very basic, um, and yet I think holds this great depth as well. So I wonder if you could introduce us, um, kind of assuming that we've never heard of it. What is, what is Jinshin? How is it used? Um, when is it used, et cetera? Yes, I'll just, I wanna just jump back briefly to the seeing practice though. Mm -hmm. Just, to, I, wanted to, I wanted to just say about seeing practice that, um, on, on retreats years ago, I would usually begin with seeing practice. I think it's a great way to begin. And one interesting thing to play with is the recommendation that the object that we're choosing to practice relaxed seeing with would be something that has a, a heart, a positive heart feeling tone to it. And now we have more positive psychology that could help understand why that might be important. Um, way back then, there was a lot of pushback against that as well. <laughs> Shouldn't I be doing something neutral instead of, and I think that it just exposes another tendency that we, we, we think that we're being more scientific or more purist or more something if we would go for the neutral, but because our tendency has been both, you know, some people say neurologically, um, evolutionarily, developmentally, um, but I think also culturally, we tend to get more weighed down in the negative. Absolutely. And so practicing meditation in a way that's not reinforcing that, but is giving a little window, a little ventilation, a little glimpse, a little trickle of connecting with something that's also kind of moving the dial in terms of our inner atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. And I... I remind my students that, you know, we're kind of veering away from the quantifiable in the class, but that those are available to us as knowledge points as well. And one thing is really interesting, what you're just speaking of, like the negative can weigh in on us. So that there's pretty hard data, which shows that like a negative thought, um, like it sticks into our brain matter in a very different way than what we could call positive thoughts do. They make bigger, deeper, lasting impressions. There are evolutionary reasons some, some suggest behind that. Um, but yeah, the, the fact of the matter is, is that negative thoughts really do sink in deeper into our brain, right? So if we, if we wanna kind of let the pendulum swing fall in the middle, we've got to kind of veer more toward the positive. Um, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just like um, maybe if someone is drunk, inebriated, they're really sure that they can drive safely, you know, and other people need to be like, I really think I need to drive you home or, you know, give me your keys right now or whatever. Mm. Um, we're so sure that we're being neutral when we're really swamped with negativity, self-criticism and so on. And we haven't tasted much wow. Wow. of some kind of ease or whatever to, mm. to realize, you know, we haven't had that sober <laughs> moment of ah, joy in life. So we, we think that the negativity is neutral. That's a striking analogy. And I think it's so fitting that like, yeah, we're kind of wandering around drunk, like thinking we're fine, thinking we're capable. Um, but yeah, thank you for sharing that. I find it helpful. Good. I'm glad. Um, okay, about Jin Chin Jitsu, it's, I love how you point out that like deep rest practice, Jin Chin Jitsu is so simple and available mm -hmm. that for that very reason, it can be easy to not get around to doing it. Yeah. So it's so easy and available. We don't have to like sign up for an expensive appointment to give ourselves some Jin Shin Jitsu, just holding any one of our fingers or thumb or a couple of fingers at a time. That's already a way of 
experimenting for yourself. Does this have any effect on me? Is this helpful for me? Uh, one of your questions was, when is it appropriate or when is it helpful to practice? I think we could even start more basic. What, what is it? You just gave us a couple of examples here. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. what is it? Yeah. So um, I, I'll give examples again. I'll give a few so that anyone who wants to, while you're listening, you can play with it yourself. One of, one of the more helpful ones for many people would be, for example, left hand on the right shoulder, just over the top of the shoulder to the back. And then the right hand on the right hip. So both hands are on the same side of the body. In this case, the right side of the body. I'm holding my elbow up because of the microphone. You would be as relaxed as possible, maybe like this or lying down with cushions if possible or you're standing in line and you just put your hand in your pocket and your hand on your shoulder and it doesn't look too looks pretty normal it could be on the other side and just the, a small technical thing would be that often skin to skin contact the palm of the hand on the shoulder just holds better and is more relaxing than trying to on on the fabric of our clothing it would often um, slip and then we're tensing muscles to hold the position so holding a finger, holding this, the shoulder and hip, um, the hands on the inner knees, um, holding the foot almost anywhere, you're holding probably several Jinshin Jitsu locations. Um, so if any of those call anybody's curiosity, you could do that while you're listening. Or you could just let yourself feel your hands and your feet, if you like. And feel like where would your hands like to go if they if you could just let them land somewhere on your body. Or it could be that you feel better with your hands off your body. And you could try that. So Jinshin Jitsu is so simple and available because it's it's really so built in, so natural. Jin means human being, and Shin means heart or sacredness, we could say. And Jitsu, one literal translation, translation of Jitsu is tricks. I think we could call it improvisation, improvisation. So like how to be a human with our limited body and mind that comes from a specific background, that's in specific circumstances now, and we have a heart and we have something that is formless as well about us somehow. And how do we do that? How do we, <laughs> how do we be, how do we be form and formless? What are some ways that help being form and formless be in alignment in a way that's more fun or that's more joyful or that's more grounded or that's more creative or, or um, with more well-being would be another, a good way to put it actually. So Jin Shin Jitsu is actually in it, the scope of it is not just about hand positions. It includes these hand positions, but it's about being, it's really about well being, including the body, mind, and our sacredness. And they call it like a physio psychological philosophy <laughs> to just include everything. How do we include everything? That would be another way to put it, as a, just as a question rather than a, a response to the question. Mm -hmm. How do we include everything? <laughs> how, do we, how do we come into, how do we tune into a wider harmony that includes everything? That would be a great definition of Jinshin Jitsu <laughs> as a question. <laughs> yeah. And so someone might have found that their hands went into a certain position. And so we have the right in a way we could say right now, we are the front edge of Jin Shin Jitsu, exploring and redefining and suggesting new possible, possible responses to the question. Mm. How do we tune into a wider harmony that includes everything with well-being? <laughs> because we could think of something that's wide enough to, to include everything and it'd be like, ah, it's too much, it's chaos, it's overwhelming, but with well-being or with peace, mm -hmm. a wider harmony, they, they say, feeling for a wider harmony. And then we would approach ourselves and our circumstances, not trying to find out, oh, what's wrong and how do I treat it, but feeling for the underlying harmony mm. and, and then kind of embodying that. Mm. The final question I would ask would be, what is 
your opinion of the relationship between contemplation and well-being. And um, sometimes, sometimes because we, I think with the, um, the commodification of mindfulness, could we say, or at least the popularization of mindfulness, we're sometimes sold any kind of contemplative practice as like, do this and you will be well, like by 5 p.m. today, you know? And it doesn't <laughs> seem to work so quickly. Um, yeah, but I just wanted to ask you, what is your understanding of the relationship between doing a contemplative practice, deep breath meditation, any other practice we want really, but doing the, a contemplative practice and being well, what is the relationship between these things? Yeah, I'm struck by the word contemplation. Uh, it's not a word that I often use because I do think it has from the last few centuries taken on more of a flavor of thinking. And the if we go further back into the roots of the word contemplation, it's it is like about the temple. <laughs> um, actually. And a temple in the sense of making a space for augur, augury. So it's, it's, that's all very interesting and could go, we could go in a lot of directions with that, but to, so con to be with the temple and well-being. Um, I'm happy to answer that question. I don't know if that's the question you meant to ask. Um, if you meant to ask more like thinking about spiritual stuff. No, it's wonderful um, to hear you bring your own flavor to it. So please go, go with that. Yeah. Yeah, so a life uh, or a lifestyle or, or living in a way that we are with the temple, we're with leaving room for different kinds of knowing in a space that is allowed to be sacred, but also is allowed to just be where we are with all of it, I think is kind of a, a basis or foundation for, for real well-being but not a well-being that's always pleasant i think that well-being can start to have room for the ups and downs of the path the ups and downs of healing mm -hmm. so rather than living a kind of superficial well-being where i'm i'm fine <laughs> um, yeah, I'm really well. <laughs> I'm just not really that in touch with myself. <laughs> but starting to practice in a way that we are starting to get into, in, into touch with, in touch with um, places that are hard to be in touch with, and we're not really necessarily equipped to be in touch with. But by being in touch with them, we start to grow some skills and wisdom with living more and more the, our wholeness as human beings. So having room through practicing, really being with, and I would, I would so con, the con of contemplation, really being with mm. our temple, like really staying with, the continuity is so important mm. to really reap the benefits. So rather than the idea of, yeah, just do the five minutes and your blood pressure goes down and you're good. It's like, that's probably true for a lot of people that it does bring the blood pressure down or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not all it does. <laughs> you know, it also does so many other things that are maybe a lot of them measurable and some of them immeasurable. But it's also helping us come back to ourselves and come back to our wholeness in ways that can be sometimes so uncomfortable, but so good. So like if we do yoga stretching, we can feel a good simple example of what sometimes something can be so uncomfortable and so good, but it's not necessarily, it's, we're not looking for trying to make it uncomfortable in order to get the goodness, because that will probably injure the body. <laughs> mm -hmm. But when we start to get to know where there's also a cycle of healing and learning where there's some uncomfortable times mm -hmm. in a periodicity of learning and healing. Mm -hmm. And, and yet there can be an overall sense of homecoming mm -hmm. or ripening. 
So we might feel more and more ourselves sometimes, or we also might sometimes feel, I don't, I don't know who this is, that is me. And that can be a life that's really full of grace, really full of intelligence and friendship, kindness, insight, and freedom that we could never have engineered through all of our measurables. So I think that one way to talk about the spiritual path, or if we think of contemplation as being with, really uniting ourselves with making space for what's here and including our different kinds of different capacities for different kinds of knowing and discovering. There starts to be a, a, a flavor that's more and more attractive that we are, we love life. And it's not just love life, like in a Nike go for it kind, you know, just do it kind of way, but it can include just do it for sure. But can also include just don't do it. <laughs> and I don't know why it can include a lot of I don't know why something more spontaneous, we, we start to feel the meaningfulness, rather than the, the meaning up in the logical mind a meaningfulness of feeling grateful, gratefully giving ourselves more and more fully to life. I love that your answer included broadening the notion of well being. Um, we in our first class, we use the dictionary definition, which which just speaks of being comfortable, being secure, being happy. And yeah, I, I love that you've you've kind of challenged that and broadened it and said that being well can include more than happiness. Um, you know, being well can include if, if we want to say comfort, fine, but it's comfort with everything that comes, right? It, it's not saying, oh, I feel great all the time, kind of comfortable. It's a willingness to sit or to be in flow with everything that comes by, no matter kind of the, the tone of what that is, right? So yeah, I like that you kind of gave your whole answer by also broadening the notion of well-being. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, and this, this is so important because we, we do notice that if we stick with the more superficial comfort and well-being and safety after a while we don't feel so alive anymore we can feel the stuckness creeping up mm -hmm. and we wonder why so it's we can feel all those words comfort safety and happiness are a good basis but it's like uh comfortable enough safe enough and happy enough to kind of fall into life mm -hmm. not just not just safety for its own for itself Mm -hmm. Safety for itself, I, then I end up in a cage and I don't want to be in a cage. I'm not well in a cage. Comfortable for itself, I, you know, is a never ending preoccupation to make the temperature a little bit more comfortable to make, you know, it's an, it ends up being a cultural obsession. Mm -hmm. You know, these are real dangers in our psyche, actually, to go for too much safety is, is a control freak lifestyle. And it's not, it's not really very happy <laughs> or a superficial happiness. But if we start to feel and get real about the joy that we feel in ourselves, when we realize even something that's difficult to realize, we remember something even that was difficult to remember, or we stretch beyond the comfort zone, there's a different kind of joy and a different kind of comfort. If we think also of comfort as being with what's strengthening, and a different kind of safety in a way. Feeling safe, I'm ready to take risks. When I feel safe, then I might dare to speak up in the classroom even though there's some fear. Mm -hmm. And I, that there's an energy movement there in that generosity to myself and others mm -hmm. that's enacting the nature of reality, which is not, you know, not two, not one. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's a fulfillment in it. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm glad that you, you know, kind of re-emphasize what I said, because it, it's so important. And I, I just said it again. <laughs> so important. It's good for us to hear it. Yeah, we need we need to hear these things to let them sink. So yeah. Thank you so much um, for for sharing with us, um, for guiding us through the meditation as well. Um, 
what a wonderful treat that was. Um, but thank you for sharing from your experience. I, I really appreciate it. It's my great pleasure. Mm -hmm. I hope it serves people well. Mm -hmm.